Hi, everybody. A relaxed Dennis Prager. I don't know why I'm always relaxed, but I'm, I think, a little more than normal just sitting back here. I'm back home. I was on the road a lot. I'm on the road a lot anyway. And it's great to be here. I was just in Dallas, in fact, just the day before, and I was doing some uh, taping of people interviewing me, and the, there was an audience and a lot of people said, how's Otto? So I actually said, why don't you all say hi, Otto? And I got them on video, and you'll be able to see it. What would you like to say? Hi, Otto! I get such a kick out of the fact that this guy is sort of a celebrity. I, I really do. I, I don't, I don't, I actually get a bigger kick out of that than I'm, than my being a celebrity, which is not doesn't play a big role in my conscious daily thinking, but this guy cracks me up. Anyway, it's great to be with you. I'm Dennis Prager, in case I didn't say. This is my home. This is the Fireside Chat, which we're pretty good. We don't miss a week, do we? And with all the travel, it's amazing. We, uh, I, I'm very committed to this. I'm committed to this because a lot of you are committed to it. It's a real chance to just talk about life give you an idea of my philosophy of life and apply it to your lives and to life generally. It's a wonderful opportunity and I, of course I take your questions. Last week we figured out that we've gotten questions from people, mostly young people, in 51 countries. And that really, I got to tell you, that blew my mind. That means that we may we may be seen in, in like a hundred because that's only the places we get questions from, 51. That's the good part of the internet. There are a lot of downsides to the internet, but there, are, it's like everything else in life. There are prices paid. There's, there's no such thing as an unmixed blessing. You know that? Everything comes with a price. I'm trying to think, is there an unmixed blessing? I guess good health. I can't think of the downside to good health. There, there, there is, I guess there's theoretically a downside, and that is you could take it for granted, and then, then you, you're not a grateful person. But that's, that's different. I mean, almost everything comes with a price. Let's put it that way. Maybe good health is one of the rare exceptions. Anyway, I want to th throw a thought at you that's really important. I have talked a number on a number of occasions of maybe the most important moral idea that I stand for and that I advocate, and that is that behavior is infinitely more important than feelings. And we live in the age of, of real, I have to say, I'm sorry, the age of stupidity, because people actually think feelings are more important, but they're not. How people behave is infinitely more important than how they feel. That's why when I'm told oh, well, we heard that so-and-so said in, in a private conversation. This reporting of private conversations is, is an example of, of the age of stupidity in which we live. I don't care what people say privately. I care what they say publicly and what they do, but not what they say privately. Say whatever you want privately. It, it's what you, say, what you say publicly, that has, that has a large effect. That's different. If there is no, there is no one on earth, the, the, the most wonderful human on earth, if we had a recording of every single private conversation, we could not make them look terrible. That's why, I, that's why this, this notion about that, that infamous tape recording of, of, of President Donald Trump and what he said about women, it, it, it's irrelevant. He said it to one guy in, in privacy it was uncouth and so on. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. It matters how, what, if he said that publicly, it'd be terrible. And, 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 and how he behaves, that's, that's the issue. Which brings me to why I'm raising this issue now. So I just read, and this was, I believe, the Washington Post. It was not a, a pro-Donald Trump newspaper. And it was that, uh, I'm paraphrasing now, the lowest rates of unemployment of non-white women, of essential, of basically of women of color, to be more precise, that is of Hispanic 
and black women, the lowest rates of unemployment, in other words, the highest rates of, un- of, of employment in re- since recorded statistics have been available. So now let me ask you a question because he's always called a racist. I don't believe he's a racist, but l- let's put that aside. Let's assume he is. I don't, ass- I don't assume that. But let's say he is. Let's say he, he really dislikes non-whites, which I don't believe for a nanosecond, for, say, the third time. But let's say it were true. You are a black woman or a Hispanic woman, and you have been wanting a job for years. You finally have a job thanks to the economic policies of the president of the United States, whom you think is a racist. Okay. So here's my question to you, this theoretical black or Hispanic woman who is now employed. What is more important to you, a president whom you think loves Hispanics and blacks, but you're unemployed, or a president you think doesn't like Hispanics and blacks, but you have a job? What would you prefer if you were given that choice? If you are normal, and I am sorry to use that term, if you're normal, you would far prefer to have the job and have a president who you think didn't like you. So isn't that the issue? If a, if a man, it, 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 there, I don't know if you recall, in the beginning of his presidency, he was called an anti-Semite. But it, it turns out he's among the most pro-Jewish, pro-Israel presidents in American history. So... Let's say he didn't like Jews, which is a little odd to imagine since his daughter is a Jew, his son-in-law is a Jew, and his grandchildren are Jews. But let's just say that were true. So what? I'm a Jew. I don't care. I care how you treat me. That is what matters in life. How do you behave toward me? Not how do you feel about me. I care about the feelings towards me of my wife my family, my my children, my extended family, and my friends. Other than that, I can't, I can't, it's not healthy to be preoccupied. It's narcissistic. I want, of course, to be loved by the people in my, in my intimate life. Now, I happen to get a lot of love in this world, and I'm very grateful for it, but I get a lot of hate too. And I've spoken about how I deal with both. But I, 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 I'm not preoccupied with what are people's feelings toward me. I'm preoccupied with how do they treat me. If the person I'm sitting next to in, an, in the airplane, let's say that person just for whatever reason doesn't like me. But if the, if the person is courteous towards me, that's all I care about. That's all that matters. And, and, and same with me. You don't care if... You shouldn't care. How do I feel? You should care how I act. It's it's impossible to overstate how bad things are when we value feelings over behavior. You know how many people abuse a spouse and then they tell them, oh, I really love you? Ask how many women have, have been, been battered. And then when, when the guy is no longer drunk, oh, oh honey, I, I, I so love you, I so love you. And he may well love her, but so what? Look at how he treats her. I'd rather be less loved and treated beautifully by my wife than more loved and treated awfully by my wife. You know how common that is where a spouse loves a spouse but mistreats them? It's very common. But it's, 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 no, it's, it's not a consolation. Oh, my spouse mistreats me but she really loves me, or he really loves me. So what? Everything is behavior. Everything is behavior. That's why I tell people, act as if you're happy. Don't wait to feel happy to act happy. Act happy, then you'll feel happy. My whole thesis in life revolves around behaviorism. That behavior is everything. Do you act good not do you feel same with intentions do you mean well i don't care if you mean well i care if you do good not mean well same in, and i don't care if you don't mean well but if you do good that's fine I, I you have no idea how often i have heard in my life oh this guy 
the guy, the, this guy with his name on that hospital building, and the only reason he gave all those millions to build that hospital was because he wanted his name on the building. To which I think, so what? The people whose lives are being saved by that hospital are being saved because this guy gave the money to build that hospital. What do I care if he wants his name on it? God bless him. I'll happily put your name on it. Why does that remove the good that he did? It's, it's, it, there's, there's no area of life that I know of where behavior is not more important than feelings. So all this, the president is this, the president is that, that's, the, that's not the issue, is what are the results of, of, of his policies? It, it's better for so many people. And that's, that's all that matters. You know what animated the, the, the belief in the, in the most murderous philosophy of the 20th century, communism? Now, Nazism was tied with it in terms of evil, of course. But the amount, number of people killed by communism is dwarfs the number of people killed by Nazism. And it was animated, a lot of people supported communism out of good intentions. They loved the idea of equality. That really animated them. There are people in the West, in Britain and the United States, who gave the secrets to the atom bomb to Stalin, a man responsible for at least 30 million innocents being killed, responsible for a, a, an entire generation of people in the Soviet Union having no freedom, no liberty, nothing, living, living like, like caged prisoners. And people in the West gave that man secrets to the atom bomb because they believed in communism. They didn't judge behavior. They judged theory, intentions. And that's why people hate capitalism. Oh, capitalism, that's selfish. Whether capitalism was selfish or not is of no interest to me. Bernie Sanders, who is, a, who is a, the most left-wing candidate in American history probably, running for president, Bernie Sanders just said, you know, let's recognize China has lifted more people out of poverty than any other country in the history of the world. And he's right. They did. But he never went to sentence number two. Thanks to capitalism. It wasn't socialism that lifted people out of poverty in China. It was capitalism. <laughs> If you, don't, if you don't like capitalism, it means you don't like people. You think you like people. Oh, I love equality and, and I hate profit. I don't know what's wrong with profit. Profit is, means money you've earned. People should earn money for, for, for making products that other people want, making medicines other people want, pr producing food people need to eat. So that's my statement for today. Once again, behavior over feelings. All right, so we'll begin with a video question. Are we ready? We press once, and here we go. All Alex, right. This is Alex. I work at PragerU, and I just got engaged. So my question for you is, if you were able to go back in time and give yourself a piece of advice when you first got engaged for the very first time, what would it be? Because, man, I need it. So the problem is, I don't know what specifically he's referring to. So, Alex, I, we may have to do a part two of this. Uh, I know that's an interesting question. Uh, I would, if I had to give myself a piece of advice going back in time, it's an, I have to think that through. But I can tell you that the piece of advice I would give you and anybody else getting engaged is, unless you're very, very, very young, and even then I'm not sure why you would do it, but I, I, don't, I don't think you should spend a lot of time engaged before you get married. Set a date and get married. I don't, I don't understand the great need for a long engagement. I mean, 
if you've been dating for a while, and I think Alex has, four years, Alex, four years. What do you you need? What you need more time? Uh, I, I would I would set the date as soon as feasible to get a you know wherever you're going to have your wedding, and get married. <laughs> I don't quite understand a long engagement. I don't know. I don't know what the purpose could be. So anyway, that's that's the piece of advice there. Now, if people ask, you know, what do you give advice for married couples? That's going to come up. I think there is a question on that. There is, in fact. So I'm going to take that. Uh, so I'm going to go back to those. Good luck, Alex. That's a very big deal. Uh, all right, I'm pressing twice. And uh, one minute. There we go. I got it. All right, here we go, everybody. Anna, 17... Uh, that's the age, in Georgia. State, I assume not the country, but the U.S. state of Georgia. Hello to everyone at the Fireside Chat, including Otto. Otto. Could you please talk about what makes a good therapist? You said there were some good therapists, but most are bad, which is worrisome for me. It should be worrisome for you. It's a very sad thing. I wish to pursue faith-based counseling as a job and want to avoid being one of the bad therapists. Also, totally off topic, do you like cats? I love cats. I grew up with cats. The problem is I'm allergic to them. Not to all, but to most. And I, I mean, I mean, not if it was just sneezing, I wouldn't care so much. But I can't breathe around them well, so. I, but I love them. They're, they're very funny cats. I get a kick out of them. But you, I think, nevertheless, having had both, I find bonding with a dog is easier. C- cats are somewhat aloof. As they say, what is it? Cats don't have owners, they have staff. That was a great line I read uh, once. That's what I feel like. We have a cat here, but it's, it's, a, a, it's a breed that I'm not allergic to, and I'm, I'm not, uh, he's not in my room anyway. Okay, anyway, that's the cats. Now for the more important part about therapists. Uh, what makes a th- good therapist? <laughs> it's, what makes a good plumber? What makes a good baseball player? What makes a a good anything? Someone who is competent at their job. What is a competent therapist? One whose patients leave healthier. Right? There can't be any other definition. Do I leave my six months, six years, whatever it might be, of therapy... Am I getting to be a healthier human? What is a healthier human? That's the next question. A healthier human is one who is able to deal with life and with people in a positive way. You you are happier. You are stronger. You are more loving. Right? I think that those are fair criteria for what a good therapist would do for you. So why are there so many bad therapists? Well, there are bad... This is a sad rule of life. I I don't say this, I say this actually with sadness. I think most of almost every profession are not uh, particularly competent. I I don't, I don't, I can't put my number, my finger on a number, but I tell you this, every single psychiatrist and psychologist that I've interviewed in my life on my radio show has said that about two thirds of their colleagues are not competent. Now, I believe them, but why would they say it if they who live the profession don't don't have reason to say that? And here is my theory on what a bad therapist uh, does. A bad therapist, this is my rule of thumb. If after six months, I'm just picking a number, if after six months of therapy, you are... Uh, you are blaming others more and more for your problems, it's probably a bad therapist. At some point, the sooner the better, you need to understand you are the captain of your ship. If your ship is sinking, don't blame your parents. Don't blame your spouse. Don't blame your boss or whomever you tend to blame. Parents are, are a very common one. I'm not saying your parents aren't to blame or your parents didn't have a bad play, a bad role in your life. Very few parents, no, no parent, let's put it this way, no parent 
is flawless. Okay? Every parent has done something that uh, is not healthy for the child. Every single parent in the history of the world. It is not possible not to have made a mistake with your child. I remember I, I saw a therapist for about six months, many, many years ago. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to resolve issues. I, and he was great, by the way. This was a great guy, an old, an old German Jewish psychiatrist. And uh, the reason he was great is he never let me get away with anything. I, the, the, an example, if a, if a therapist lets you engage in self-pity, things are not good. Self-pity has never helped anybody. And one time I spoke about what I thought my parents had done to me when I was much, much younger. And I'll never forget, obviously I'll never forget because I haven't forgotten. <laughs> and he said in his, in his German accent, he goes, you know, uh, Dennis, I just wonder if we had a video camera there, whether it would be exactly as you described it. It changed my life. How do I know that my memory from when I was six is accurate? fully accurate, right? You're a six-year-old, you, you, you perceive things in your way and then, and, and then there's time. Time doesn't exactly clarify memories. That's why these, there, was a, there was a movement, what was it, restored memory? What was it called? Something like restored memory. And a lot of them, you know, oh, I really was abused by a parent, but it turned out in the great majority of cases, the therapist had fed, fed horrible information into the patient's brain. And it caused a terrible rupture and permanent hurt to the parent who did nothing and was now being accused all of a sudden out of nowhere with having molested their child. But, but even putting that, I, I, I had no belief my parents ever molested me. It was nothing even remotely like that. And I don't even remember what it was. I only remember his response. If we had a video camera, Dennis, it might not be quite as accurate as you think you remember it. So anyway, the guy didn't let me get away with anything. And he put the onus, the burden of my taking care of my life was on me. He was a good therapist. And uh, I'll tell you an example that I really find quite uh, uh, depressing is the number of therapists who side with a, uh, their patient in not speaking to a parent. I would think a good therapist would try to have a child and parent reconnect, not get further alienated. That to me is a good therapist. That doesn't mean you have to love your parent. It doesn't mean you have to be buddy buddies. It doesn't mean you have to forget all the bad that they did. I'm not asking for any of that. But unless your parent is evil, a, a, you should try to reconnect not go, yes, oh boy, I totally understand why you wouldn't want to ever talk to your mother again. That, that's, that's a bad therapist. So if you, here's my rule, if you, six months into it, if you're still blaming others for your problems, it's probably not a great therapist. All right, next. Prathit, 28 years old in India. What's my timing? Hello, sir. Sir to you. I assume, is Prathita male or a female name? See, I don't know. I'm sorry. It may be ma'am. Anyway, hello, Prathit. Although I do have some reservations regarding some of the views expressed in PragerU videos, I do like to watch them and have learned a lot from them. By the way, this is to your credit, not ours. Anyone who reads or listens to or watches things they don't necessarily agree with that's to their credit. That's why I read the New York Times every day. I make sure to read things I don't agree with. It's very, very important. During fireside chat number 96, someone asked, what advice would you give first-time parents? You said to love your husband, wife, more than your child. Could you please elaborate the rationale behind this argument. Please know I have a lot of respect for you as I find you to be a very decent man. Let me comment on that, by the way. 
anyone who tells someone else, I think you're a good person, a decent person, like you just did, it's, it's as much a statement about the person making the comment as about the person receiving the comment. Bad people don't tell people you're a decent person. Good people think about others' goodness. So, it's, so we never met, but I say the same to you. And by the way, I am a decent man. I, 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 I've always wanted to be. I am not a perfect man. I am not a saint. But I am a decent man. That is true. Can I elaborate the rationale behind this argument that to love your, your spouse more than your child? I didn't say, I didn't say love your, love, I don't think I said love them. I said they, they, are, they should be number one in your life. You can't love your spouse more than your child. Parent-child love is, is, is an instinct. I mean, it's in the animal kingdom. It's just so powerful. I would never say love X more than Y. I, I, so I know I didn't say that, but I understand why you would have heard it that way. I didn't say that. I said, take care of them more. Uh, be more attentive to them. Or even, and I don't mean quantitatively. Obviously, a baby needs a lot of attention. I understand that. But the number one person in your life should be your spouse, not your child. That I do say. You married somebody to be number one in their life and for them to be the number one in your life. Why are they all of a sudden displaced? Because you have a child. Anyway, your child's going to grow up and if, and if healthy, is going to leave you. Ideally, your spouse won't leave you. What are you going to do then? The center of my life has left the house. My child, the center of my life. No, the center of your life is your spouse. Talking about in terms of persons. That's, that's how I stand by that very, very strongly. Doesn't mean you ignore your child. Number one doesn't mean that number two <laughs> is irrelevant. Anyway, your child wants that. Children th may think they want the parent to revolve around them. But it's a terrible thing for a child. My parents, God bless them, may they rest in peace, lived a very long life, 89 and 96. My mother died in 89, my dad at 96. Their lives revolved around each other. And I paid a, I paid a, a price for that because there was too much so. But it's okay. Because once I was an adult, I was thrilled that their lives revol revolved around each other. They were so such not a burden on me. I didn't want, I didn't want to be the center of their life. No child, no adult child who's healthy wants to be the center of their parents' life. You want your parents to love you and all that, but for you to be everything in it, it's too big a burden. I, I, I didn't want that. I wanted them to enjoy me and all that, and they did. But they were so happy with each other that I, they didn't revolve around me or me around them. It was great. It was, I, I, was, I was grateful to them. Ask kids whose parents' lives do revolve around them. You know, ask a 30-year-old or a 40 or a 50-year-old. They're not happy about it. It's not good. The most central person in your life should be your spouse. And it's good for the child to know that. Because it's easy to make a narcissist. And if, you're, if you revolve around your child, if they revolve around you, or, or you revolve around them, I should say, you may well produce a narcissist. What's our time? Well, maybe I have time for one more. Let's see. Yeah, why not? Mark, 61 years old. See, I don't discriminate against older, older, older questioners. Rural Manatee County in southwest Florida. I had a question on my show. A, guy, a kid, a 19-year-old, called my radio show and uh, said, so Dennis, does God have a sense of humor? And, and if so, how do you know? And uh, so I, my first thought, and I said it on the air, the biggest proof I have that God has a sense of humor is the manatee. 
<laughs> and if any of you have not seen a picture of, of a manatee or, or been seen one in real life, you'll know what I mean. So you live in Manatee County. Okay. What should you do as a father if your 15-year-old son says he no longer believes in God? Well, this is very common for young people who are raised with a belief in God to have a period of atheism, agnosticism, struggle with God. And you, you respect your, your child's view. You take your child's views. You don't say, oh, you're just a 15-year-old. No wonder you think that. You don't dismiss it. But you don't accept it. You argue. You say, okay, so why don't you believe in God? And then, and then you give answers. You really believe everything came about by itself? You really believe? You think that's rational? Everything you know has a maker, right? You see a camera, you know there's a camera maker. You see a computer, there's a computer maker. But you see the world, there's no world maker? The world made itself? And, and, and unguided by any intelligence, created intelligence? You mean intelligence came from non-intelligence? Einstein came from a rock? That to you is more logical than a creator or a higher intelligence? Okay, not to me. Anyway, life's infinitely richer if you, uh, if you believe in God, or at least act as if you believe in God. Remember, I'm a behaviorist. So you, you, uh, you, you, they want you to fight back. That's, that's your job. But you have to learn the arguments. That's why I do what I do, is to provide people intellectual ammunition for good things like belief in God. And I have a lot of that, obviously, in my major religious work, and that is the Rational Bible. And I would hope all of you watching would read my Bible commentary. It'll, ch it, it'll change your life. I do believe that. It's very, very rich stuff. So anyway, that's what I would do with a 15-year-old. Okay, let's, let's talk about it. I think I got pretty powerful arguments, my dear son. And I guess that's about it, isn't it? Thank you for being with me. And I will see you next week from the Prager House to yours. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to keep these fireside chats free, Please do by donating to PragerU.